My name is Ania Wilgopolan. I work in Institute of Geophysics, Polish Academy of Sciences. And uh, today's lesson is going to be a little bit different. Uh, so you clearly already know a lot about the Arctic. I can see some familiar names, so you probably participated in many uh, Antarctic webinars, but there are still some facts, I think, about this region that might, I hope, surprise you, or maybe not, we'll see. And this lesson will be dedicated uh, to, to them. Uh, they are from, uh, the, I chose them myself, and uh, this is my choice of fun fact, this is why I encourage you to find your own. And um, they're from very various domains, a, bit, a little bit of geography, archaeology, and so on and so on. Some are funny, I think, and some might be frightening. And uh, some are simply curious and always good to know. So let's start. Uh, let's start with a very simple fact, I think. I'll just take my laser, laser pointer. Uh, where did the name Arctic come from? I think that it was uh, mentioned somehow during uh, one of the uh, lessons. Yes, good morning to you all. And uh, Arctic comes from Greek, like many other names, of course, from a Greek word for bear, Arctic. But you might think that uh, it is uh, because polar bears are kings of the Arctic and, and live there. But that day name doesn't come from the iconic polar bear, but actually from constellations in the northern sky, in the northern sky of the Arctic. There is Ursa Minor, which is little bear, looks like this, and Ursa Major, this is great bear or deeper, there are different names, but bear is, uh, is more popular. So this is how, uh, well, these are separate stars, uh, of course, but if we connect them, like we connect the dots, this is what we get. And uh, people in antiquity, good morning, uh, imagined that this represents a image of a great bear and a uh, little bear, small bear, Ursa Minor and Ursa, Ursa Major. So this is from Arctos and not the polar bear that you might think. But it was just a warm up. But talking about bears, polar bears exactly, uh, this time about this polar bear king of the Arctic uh, himself, despite what we might think, uh, first of all, we think that polar bears are white, and they are not. First of all, their, uh, be, uh, they, their fur is not white. Their skin is black. We don't, do not often see a skin of a uh, polar bear, and this is not this unusual for animals, and especially for northern animals, because you know that black, a black color, if we may call it a color, black attracts uh, light attracts uh, energy, it's light, uh, and as, as a result, this way they attract and absorb more heat, of course, during a sunny day. And but this is one thing that their skin is actually black, but their fur is not white. Uh, each hair is a hollow tube, it's hollow inside. It's transparent, actually. Polar bears are transparent and black. This is a, a hollow tube, they, but they look white because it's each of these um, hollow tubes reflects the light. So on the sunny day, it traps the sun and uh, traps the heat, keeps the bear, uh, bear warm. Their, their body temperature is very, uh, very high, of course, on the sunny day, when they absorb and accumulate the heat. Uh, of, uh, another thing about the spur is that it's oily and it doesn't absorb water. It absorbs um, heat, but not water. It's water repellent, what we call. Uh, so they don't. Uh, the hairs that get met when they uh, they when they get wet. 
so they can shake off uh, easily. But how is that possible that this kind of hollow tubes, and this is a big, uh, in, in mag this is a microscope uh, image of, magnified image of this uh, hollow tube. This is what each and every uh, hair looks like. So uh, what makes this combination of black and uh, transparent look uh, for our bears so uh, white, at least when they're uh, clean? There are uh, actually a few um, phenomena that allow that. First, there is, uh, <clears throat> there is a luminescence. Uh, so, uh, luminescence is accelerated by light scattering particles. So, uh, if you look at the polar bear's hair uh, really closely through a super microscope, you can see those there are tiny, tiny like bumps. And there are light scattering uh, particles. So uh, this disrupts the, the light, the beam of light, and bre breaks this one beam into more beams. And the, those beams are sent into different uh, directions. This is, this is scattering. This is scattering. Uh, so this is one thing. And uh, Kera uh, there's also keratin uh, protein in it, like in every every hair that we that, that we have, and also these protein molecules have slightly <coughs> whitish uh, color, which further contributes to polar bear fur appearing white. So most of all, there's luminescence. There's also some action of uh, ultraviolet uh, light, but this is more complicated and uh, the presence of lots of keratin uh, proteins. Uh, so, fun fact number three, uh, absolutely different domain. Uh, what do you know about Arctic Circle? What's, what is Arctic Circle? Does Arctic Circle really exist, like, a, like a, there is a border or some, I don't know, uh, some land feature, landmark that you can step on it and say, well, this is the Arctic Circle. First of all, Arctic Circle is imaginary. I mean that uh, it's an imaginary line. There is no landmark, there is no actual border that you can step on. Uh, it circles the northernmost parts of the Earth, and it is um, parallel to equator. So as you can see here, this Arctic Circle, this is the equator, and they're parallel on the map and as this circle and um, on the globe, we might say. Uh, what it uh, marks, it, uh, it marks the region into which for at least 24 hours in a year, the sun doesn't fall below the horizon. And also for at least 24 hours in winter, uh, the sun doesn't rise above the, the horizon. So it's a uh, imaginary line the, the when we cross it then we can have we go uh, towards polar night and uh, polar day uh, and of, of course the northernmost power point is six months of one uh, of night and six months um, of uh, of night and six months of day but this position that we draw here isn't the actual real position of it. We can uh, draw it like this, uh, more or less on the map, but it's actually moving. It's wandering, even though it's imaginary, because this border of polar night and uh, polar day is moving. It isn't fixed. Uh, because of, but, but why does it, uh, why, why does it move? Uh, it moves no, slowly, northwards, towards north, towards North Pole, about 15 meters every year. It's going north and north and north. And why is that? Because of variances in Earth's actual tilt. Actual tilt, this is the tilt that Earth moves, uh, moves around. And this actual tilt, this is about 
the, this angle is about 23 degrees, but it's not fixed. There are variances uh, in it, and because of it, the, this border of day and uh, night is moving to northwards every um, every year. So if you see that on the map, well, the 15 meters every year is not a lot, but eventually it's going north and north and north. And being here in this sky uh, subject, let's say, uh, do you know Polaris? What Polaris is? Here you can see Polaris. It's an, uh, this uh, Polaris on North Star in this constellation, in Little Bear, Ursa Minor constellation. This is uh, like uh, the top of it. It's here. It's marked as very, very bright. Come on, it's one of the most famous stars, element of sky in general, uh, that, that we know of. Uh, the, but what is so special about the North Star? The North Star, you can see, is here in this image. But what does this image show? Uh, it, it is known for the fact that it stays fixed in the sky. What does it mean? It marks the location of skies North Pole, because we have uh, like a representation of North Pole in the sky. It is the point around which, from our perspective, the whole sky turns. I want to highlight that it's from our perspective that the sky turns. And that's why you can always use Polaris to find the direction North. Uh, and Polaris that we have now hasn't been the only North Star in history because the North Star, the feature of North Star is that it is fixed in the sky, fixed in one point, and we can also, also always look at it and find uh, find North. Uh, so why is, why is it that it doesn't move? Because it is located, like I said, in, at the North um, Pole Celestial Sky uh, North Pole, and um, the, this, pole, this pole marks true true north. It was very, especially in the past, it was very important in navigation. Uh, you can see here how uh, um, latitude of an observer was and still can be determined. So you looked at uh, the, uh, the the north south polaris and the angle above the horizon. On, uh, which you can see between the horizon and the line connecting the observer and the uh, North Star is observer's latitude. And Polaris is um, uh, placed at distance of 433.8 uh, light years from the Earth. And this is an extreme, a large distance, and it has two important effects. First of all, well, it is the reason why this star seems to be station, stationary, uh, directly above the North Pole, year-round. And uh, light rays from Polaris are parallel, uh, virtually parallel when they reach the Earth. This means that all light from Polaris meets the Earth at the same angle. And uh, this is important also because it seems uh, to be the brightest star in the, uh, in the sky, but actually uh, from the point of view of energy and light, it is, it is not the brightest star, but it seems like to be the brightest star uh, in the air. And uh, like I said, it was very important to mark your location, to determine your location. <clears throat> So for observers at the North Pole, when you stand at the North Pole, the stars, the star lies directly overhead. It, it is, if you stand on the North Pole, it's over your head. For the observers on the equator, it sits on the horizon. And uh, how can you use it to determine, uh, to determine uh, like directions, geographical directions? So when you face Polaris, and stretch your arms sideways, your right hand points to east, and your left hand, of course, points to 
point the way. Uh, so uh, and I'd like to show you one the image explaining what you see depending on where you stand. And uh, this is actually uh, an image from site that is uh, arguing with uh, flat Earth uh, believers. You know that there are some people who believe that flat that Earth is flat, but the fact uh, the the way we observe, the way we perceive. Uh, Polaris, North uh, Star, is uh, is the evidence that the Earth is round. It is not. It is not flat in any way. So, like I said, observer on the North Pole, the, the star lies exactly directly overhead. If we stand on the equator, it sits on the horizon. And uh, in mid latitudes, you can um, you can see here that the the angle between the horizon and the way you see uh, Polaris is your actually your latitude. And talking about North Pole, uh, we often speak about this North Pole, but actually there is not only one North Pole. We can name four, well, three or four, three from maybe more scientific point of view and one from uh, another point of view. So there are actually four North Poles. There is uh, terrestrial North Pole, in other words, geographic North Pole. It's a fixed geographic point, which is opposed to South Pole, of course. Um, it is like a top of the spinning uh, spinning Earth. That's just ge geographical uh, point. Uh, the point where, if you imagine the axis um, around which uh, the, the Earth rotates, then if we stick that axis to, to the Earth, like a, a stick, when we have geographic North Pole. But uh, we often uh, use uh, compass to determine where North North Pole is. Well, when you use a compass and it points north, it's actually not pointing this point, this geographic North Pole. It's pointing so-called North Deep Pole or North Magnetic Pole. And you see it's, uh, it's quite distant from it. It's still within the uh, Arctic Circle, but uh, it's not that close. Uh, so magnetic north pole or, uh, or north deep, deep pole is what um, is what compass is pointing. Uh, so uh, this is uh, uh, this is why the, we have this, this second uh, north pole, but we also have a so-called geomagnetic north pole, and it's a all different thing. You can see it's really far away from the top of Earth. It's, uh, it's here, exactly. And um, it's actually an imaginary, uh, imaginary point. It's calculated using mathematical models based on um, imaginary line running through geomagnetic center of, uh, of Earth. And uh, over the, and it's not fixed because it's only calculated with models. So over the past century, the geomagnetic North Pole, this one, has moved, has migrated from Greenland to Canada. So now it's in uh, in Canada. So, but um, if it's only imaginary or uh, determined by calculation, so who cares about geomagnetic North at all? We have uh, geographic North Pole. People want to reach. We have magnetic. North Pole that we use to determine direction, but how about North uh, geomagnetic uh, pole? Who needs it? Well, for example, aurora hunters need it. So uh, the most spectacular views of aurora of northern light uh, occur uh, in in this ring centered around uh, geomagnetic North Pole. This is uh, this is one thing, and. Uh, Another and the fourth North Pole is just a city. It's a city in Alaska, 
the, in 1933 it was uh, incorporated into uh, Fairbanks, so it's another Northwell, but it's just a, just the name uh, of a city, but still uh, but in, in an ask. And uh, another interesting fact about uh, North Pole, any North Pole, and this geographic, in this, this case, geographic North Pole mostly, this is the explorer, Frederick Cook. He claimed to be the first to the North Pole, geographic North Pole in this case, but in fact, to this day, we are not 100% sure who did it first. We cannot determine that. But if you want to have some uh, real fun with uh, magnetic North Pole, you should position yourself at the magnetic North Pole, if you ever have a chance, with a compass. So uh, if you hold the compass horizontal, the needle will do one of three things. Uh, Either will, it will point to the same spot as the last time you used it, wh whenever it was, and uh, either it will spin slowly and will stop at random point, or it will point anything magnetic that you see that, that you happen to be wearing at the moment. But this will happen if you stand directly at the north magnetic pole with your compass. Uh, another fun fact, and this time we're going a little bit east to Siberia. And do you know that Arctic also holds doorway to hell? This doorway to hell is uh, Batagaika uh, crater. Uh, it began forming not that long ago, in 1960s. Like I said, we're in Siberia, so it is here. And it looks a bit like this. Uh, unfortunately, the voice of video doesn't seem to be working, but only a few uh, images of it, maybe, at least. So this is how it looks like from from above. Um, locals uh, call it gateway to the underworld, doorway to hell. Uh, and since it started forming in 1960s, it has grown to a monstrous, monstrous size, like you could uh, see. Uh, it's not a gateway to the underworld, really. It's actually a very real example of our changing, warming uh, climate. But the Gaika crater is a thermocarst depression in, uh, in, in Taiga. Uh, it, was, uh, it began to form uh, after a forest were cleared, it was uh, raised here. Uh, they cut down the trees to prepare area for the road to, to be built in the region. And uh, the area, of course, is one of the coldest regions and it's layered in permafrost. But uh, when the trees were removed, they, also the protection of the ground from sun rays was removed because the forest was protecting it. So the ground began warming and the layers of permafrost began to thaw. And uh, the crater that has now formed was named after a river that was uh, nearby. Uh, why is it also called the gateway to the underworld? Not just because it's a deep hole in the ground, but also because of uh, noises that lockers are said to hear coming to, to, from the crater, like noises from hell that they are afraid to go uh, go near it. But this, these are actually noises of uh, of cracking, of uh, of uh, and of ground uh, ground moving. And uh, because of this formation of this thermo, uh, thermocast formation, uh, ice deposits from the last ice age are now being exposed. And this is not good because this ice contains a lot of organic matter and a uh, lot of carbon. 
and if that is uh, evaporated, let's say, into the atmosphere, that is really, really uh, not uh, not good. And so it uh, shows us very, very permafrost. And uh, but there is also a good, maybe a good thing about it, because researchers believe that exposed ice, exposed layers of soil, uh, hold like 200,000 uh, years of geological and biological uh, history. Uh, it um, even in from uh, starting from 1960s, where it began to form and then uh, it began to grow. It uh, like uh, um, showed that uh, with following layers being exposed, it showed uh, remains of animals that were. Uh, buried there in the past, like Pleistocene horse, uh, prehistoric uh, bison, and uh, cave lions and uh, cave wolves. So lots of uh, lots of Pleistocene animals from from the period uh, are appearing uh, there. And uh, yeah, about uh, about. Uh, weird things, weird biological things uh, appearing uh, out of nowhere. Uh, we have fun fact number seven, giant Chukchi blob. What is Chukchi for starters? It's a, it's a sea. It's a marginal sea of Arctic Ocean. It's here between Russia and Alaska. And um, mm, there are some typical algae blooms that are in the similar uh, areas. And uh, it's not so uh, uncommon because uh, in this sea the waters are shallow and light can penetrate to the seabed. But uh, in 2009, something really, really weird appeared. So uh, it was it wasn't long ago. It was in 2009. You can find uh, information on the internet and from newspapers. Is that a giant? oil spill or maybe there was a, some kind of catastrophe of uh, of a sheep uh, or something like that and no one in the area could recall anything like this before it looked like this it, it was brown to black it was uh, oily quite disgusting very very large and a large it was Floating in the Chukchi uh, Sea between some some locations, some some cities in uh, Alaska. It was uh, the length of this map observed was at least 19 kilometers, so it was uh, really really large. Of course, those it was also colored black, so it was really unusual. And uh, eventually, there were some uh, samples taken, of, and it was determined that it's alive. It's uh, those are algae, actually, a large, an, uh, extreme um, bloom of algae. But there were uh, examiners were not even able to determine the species of the algae. The color is really weird for the algae. They're usually green or red, but uh, black is not uh, not usual for marine uh, marine algae. So there are several hypotheses about this color. Uh, they said maybe it's some uh, level of the composition that there were already some of them were already decomposed. With, but actually, to this day, we do not know for sure. And those blobs uh, appear sometimes not as big as this one, uh, but they appear uh, sometimes still in various uh, regions in the Arctic Ocean. But imagine seeing like at 19 kilometers black spot of you don't know what that like looks like a like a giant blob like like something even extra terrestrial uh oh this is one of my favorite fun facts and this time we're in norway and uh, longyear bn and uh, it's in, in, in Svalbard, uh, actually uh you may remember it's the uh, biggest uh, human um, human location uh, in Svalbard, and uh, what is, is many things probably are illegal in Longyearbyen, but actually dying is illegal there. So because the town's graveyard stopped accepting new inhabitants, we might say, 70 years ago. Uh, so why is that? Uh, 
like I said, it, it's the, it's the biggest uh, human uh, settlement, but a tiny town, like 2,000 residents, and the and the ground there, of course, is permanently frozen because like the average temperature in February is minus uh, 17. So uh, why did they stop accepting new inhabitants of the graveyard? It was after it was discovered that the permafrost prevented dead bodies from decomposing because no more normally bodies decompose and uh, instead they were remaining perfectly preserved so they're almost the same as they were buried and uh, but why is it why is this uh, so uh, dangerous because uh, a few years ago, a group of scientists decided to uh, conduct this, a study what keeps the corpses uh, not decomposed, and they examined tissue uh, from person who died uh, in the town and found that this body had preserved the influenza virus since, since this person's death in 1970. Influenza, but maybe Spanish flu term is more familiar to you. Yes, it's, uh, it was ma uh, one of the most, the epidemic of Spanish flu was one of the most historically, most catastrophic disease outbreaks ever. It killed like uh, 100 million people uh, around, uh, around the globe. And uh, also in Longyearbyen, 11 people died in uh, 1918, 17, 1918, uh, died of the Spanish flu and they were buried in the village. Uh, so uh, it, it was also because um, they were usually buried without coffins because there were too many deaths at the same time and, and people were uh, buried without, uh, without uh, coffins. But of course, uh, the nature takes its course and people die in long but uh, the ter uh, they usually they don't die violently there are only 2,000 people no car accidents no murders uh, so uh, they die, die naturally and people who are terminally ill in your, your long are uh, transported to the mainland from Svalbard for their final days and they are buried and they are buried there, not to move the cemetery. Fun fact number seven, uh, bird poop. Uh, we keep talking about uh, climate change and how warming of the Arctic can be dangerous on many levels, like killing permafrost, releasing viruses, etc. But um, there are some elements and some surprising elements that contribute to cooling of the area, not warming of the area, like bird uh, poop. This is a puffin you can recognize. And uh, there are millions of birds breeding in the Arctic uh, that, are, that deposit they poop, the they guano. And this is a, creates like a very valuable source of fertilizer for, uh, for, um, for the farmers, for example. Uh, but what, um, what this species, what this guano contains, it's a lot of ammonia, tons of ammonia uh, annually. And this ammonia rises into the atmosphere, and there is a chemical reaction with sulfuric acid and water, and tiny particles are formed uh, that are nucleus for uh, and small, small uh, droplets. And because uh, clouds, um, maybe let's start with this clouds uh, are formed uh, because this ammonia and this reaction in, in the uh, earth makes uh, contributes to uh, formation of clouds so how are just quickly how are clouds formed uh, what is needed to for a cloud to form is a con condensation nucleus and this condensation nucleus is a small, small particle and the size of a, a cloud uh, droplet. So uh, when this uh, 
this reaction is between ammonia from guano and sulfuric acid and water takes place. This nucleus is uh, formed, uh, and this then uh, the clouds uh, are formed uh, are formed uh, around. But uh, actually, that um, scientists admit that this bird poop um, produces only a modest uh, cooling effect. Uh, because it doesn't, it's not that it's going to stop uh, global um, warming uh, altogether. But but still, it's uh, um, it's cooling um, cooling the atmosphere, lowering the temperature because clouds are protecting uh, ground surface from uh, sun rays, from sun energy. Uh, this one we can maybe. Oh yes, this is uh, this is interesting. Uh, sharks. Sharks seem to be present mostly in warm areas, but there are also specific Arctic sharks. They may be they're very they have very interesting features that may be very long lived. Some uh, maybe may live even up to 200 years, like some sharks found uh, around Greenland. And they like very like cold uh, cold uh, temperatures, and uh, unlike those uh, oceanic arcs from the you know, Pacific uh, Ocean, uh, they are native to North Atlantic waters around Greenland, around Canada, around uh, Iceland. But they're poorly known. That the first ever photo image was taken uh, of a shark was uh, in this region was uh, taken in 1995. Another interesting uh, thing is that their flesh, their uh, meat, we might say, is poisonous. They um, contain high levels of uh, trimethylamine oxide, and um, which helps to uh, regulate their osmotic uh, osmotic uh, pressure. And but actually, uh, in Greenland, this shark flesh was. Uh, eaten but prepared in a very specific way to avoid uh, being poisoned with this uh, with this uh, TMAO trimethylamine oxide. So uh, the meat was buried in the ground for 12 weeks. It was freezed, uh, refreezed, unrefreezed, unfreezed, and so on and so on. And then it was dried for several months and cut into cubes. And the end product was safe, and it was called hakarl, and it was a delicacy. So it was not after all this uh, freezing and refreezing, it was not uh, um, any more uh, any more dangerous. Uh, a question to you, if you're still with me: uh, If you had to bring um, lots of food to the Arctic. How much food is uh, to spend a year there? You know, maybe that uh, during wintering in Polish uh, station Hornsund, there are 10, 11 people at the same time who spend a year there. So, how much food should be brought there, you think? How many eggs? How much bread? How much milk? How much rice? How much butter? What do you, what do you say? These are the numbers. 6,500 eggs. 140 kilograms of bread, but also lots of flour to bake it. 75 kilograms of rice, lots of butter. It was, that surprised me. 270 kilo, kilo of butter and 1,000 liter of milk, and uh, also some sweetened milk in tubes. Uh, 15 kilograms, of, um, so uh, quite uh, quite a lot. But uh, why did I start talking about this? Uh, the eggs. 6,500 eggs uh, are supplied to wintering uh, team. Um, but the eggs are really tricky because they cannot be throw, uh, frozen and they need to be uh, very fresh, otherwise there's no way uh, to use them. So how to keep uh, eggs fresh and uh, not without freezing them because not, it's not possible. There is a special trick they use uh, in Hornsund. Every week there is a particular person at the station who has to do a very particular job. Turn the eggs around. 
And why is that? Of course, not one by one, but the whole box, but uh, X around uh, every week. Why is that? To keep them fresh, because the egg goes bad when the yellow part, the egg yolk, touches the shell. And it is protected from it with a small cushion filled with air. But if the egg rests in the same position for a long time, the gravity uh, makes the, that the cushion lo loses this air. And uh, to avoid this, you need to regularly, on a regular basis, uh, turn the eggs around. Another thing about the eggs, they need to be as fresh as possible before the transport to the station, of course. Uh, so they need to be laid no sooner than one week before the transport. But the trick is that also they shouldn't be washed because there is a protective layer in non-washed uh, uh, eggs. So, and it's extremely difficult to get non-washed eggs uh, nowadays, especially 6,500 non-washed eggs. And uh, now something completely different, as Monty Python said. Uh, you're probably too young to remember Monty Python. Uh, another um, habit, uh, inhabitant uh, of uh, Arctic Sea, of Arctic Ocean, is this very ugly uh, fish. It's an Atlantic wolf fish, a voracious uh, predator, and uh, but in the, with a very ugly face, we might say. Uh, but um, I'm mentioning it for another reason because it's a uh, Mm, uh, it likes this very, very cold uh, water, but can you imagine uh, swimming in water that is from minus 1.2 to uh, plus 2 um, centigrade? That's very, very cold. And um, where they live, and it's very, very deep, uh, it's really, really freezing. So how do they do that without wearing wetsuits? They have something even better. They have concentration of antifreeze compound in their blood. There is a special DNA sequence uh, that produces antifreeze protein. It's a so-called antifreeze protein type 3 that allows them that their blood does not freeze and they can survive uh, there. Uh, I need to skip something because uh, we are running out of time. But uh, another thing, another uh, come back to to Russia and uh, to Siberia and to uh, the Ice Age. Uh, scientists have managed to grow plants from seeds, from material uh, that was 32,000 years old. Uh, it was hidden in the ice uh, and and I'm not making this up. If, the, if you watch uh, the Ice Age, the cartoon, um, it was hidden by an Ice Age squirrel. This was this squirrel in Ice Age that was protecting this precious seed. And this is what happened. A squirrel um, hid uh, a seed, and for th 32,000 years it was frozen uh, in the ice. And now um, scientists, Russian scientists, uh, managed to recreate it to grow and this is this plant this is the plant that we've grown from 32,000 year old um seeds it's uh, like a uh, re resurrection so and we're coming to, to the end and uh, more of political geography uh, maybe um Paroi Islands uh, some of you had an opportunity to be there and you know how beautiful it is and uh, what's particular about it is that there is uh, it's a very small country the population is five uh, 50,000 people altogether living in the forest plus 70,000 sheep so there are more sheep actually than people there and uh, but there is all over 80 different nationalities forming this population of 50,000 people uh, Faroe Islands may be very beautiful, but life there is not that simple. Like all fruits and all vegetables, other than potatoes, are imported to the Faroe. It's not easy even to find a good uh, apple. Uh, so, uh, but also there are some good points. If you hate mosquitoes, that this is a place for you. There aren't any mosquitoes on the Faroe Islands or on Iceland, as a matter of fact. Another interesting. 
uh, Arctic country. Uh, there are lots of interesting facts about uh, the Iceland, and some of them were, were mentioned uh, by Julian Podburski during one of our webinars. Uh, I'll just uh, like to tell one thing. Um, it's uh, Iceland has the most uh, drinks, the most Coca-Cola per capita than anywhere in else in the world, in the U.S. and any other other uh, country. Also, it's a, there is very little violence. Crime in Iceland is very low. Violent crime is practically non-existent. And um, Icelandic police does not even carry a gun. Uh, one man has been shot by the police ever in the history of the country. And, um, and Iceland was only uh, in one war, and you can barely call it war. It's called, I won't say it in Icelandic, but it's a, it was called Cold, Cold War. Uh, it was a dispute between Iceland and the UK over, over fishing grounds in the 60s and 70s, quite famous. Uh, but uh, no, so no violent crime, no uh, guns carried by the police, no wars that Iceland was involved, and no mosquitoes. Uh, mosquitoes too, and uh, this is uh, if you're no you, none of you is from uh, from Iceland or Faroe Islands. So this is how uh, Icelandic uh, surnames are formed. So if you your uh, father if, if you're a male and your father is uh, Einar, the, um, so you, then your uh, surname is Einarsson son of Einar. And if you're a, a female and uh, your father is Jon, for example, your surname is Jon's daughter. Uh, that means daughter of uh, Jon. So this is an interesting uh, way of forming uh, surnames uh, too. And the very last fact, and we don't actually know who owns uh, the Arctic, because for the uh, Question, who owns the Arctic? The answer is, that depends. Uh, so uh, there are, of course, some uh, some actual countries, but there's also this uh, law of sea, so sea-covered uh, sea area. Uh, and this is more complicated because each nation has control of the area up to 200 nautical miles of its coast. So everyone with a shoreline in the Arctic, get some of the Arctic uh, waters. And this is uh, very complicated also about other regulations that uh, allows to extend this. And this is important for fisheries uh, and tra transport. But what I'd like to show you is uh, that um, you see this photo here. This is a Russian flag placed uh, by a robot on the bottom uh, of the ocean. So. Um, uh, in August 2016, um, uh, Russians like wanted to uh, claim the right to the uh, expansion of, uh, of of their sea area. So there was a nuclear-powered po Russian icebreaker, icebreaking vessel, uh, vessel that was that went through the Arctic ice, then placed those miniature submarines down to the bottom of the sea. And they planted a Russian flag on the bottom of the sea. Of course, you cannot make formal claims just by planting a flag. There has to be uh, an evidence demonstrating that this is a size of continental shelf that, that we control. But still, they took the effort to put the flag there. <laughs>